good morning, church. It's good to see everybody. If you have your Bibles, we are in Ephesians 5 again. We are looking at uh, verses 15 through 21 this morning. Uh, kind of a shorter section of verses. The reason why I'm only preaching these six is because my other option was to preach all the way through chapter 5 and not break up the units of thought. And so I wanted to tackle the passage about husbands and wives next week uh, uninterrupted. And yes, because I'm stalling big time and at the same time building anticipation to tell my wife to submit. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, We are in verse 15, and here's what it says. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh, Let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just once again want to come before you and um, Lord, we just ask that you would, that you just overwhelm us with your goodness. I just pray, Lord, that as everyone leaves here today, that we would be moved by the gospel of Jesus Christ that it would hit us in such a way that it would just impact us, that it would uh, just cause us to vibrate from our innermost being, Lord, and that it would just transform us uh, and just move us into obedience and joy in the Lord. Lord, apart from you, we can do nothing And so it's to that end that I just pray that you would speak through me today, that you'd give me the thoughts, that you'd give me the words, and that you would prevent me from saying anything that would be uh, misleading or heretical or just unprofitable for this congregation. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as I said, we're in chapter 5 today, and since chapter 4 of Ephesians, Paul has been giving instructions on how the church, the faith community, should continue to conduct itself. Uh, Just a very quick review, Uh, he's not writing and instructing people on how to become believers, how to attain salvation, but he is writing to believers, those who have been saved by grace, uh, through faith. He's writing to believers who believe in Jesus Christ, and he's instructing us on how to live out our life, to uh, live into the life and the identity that Jesus has brought us into. If you remember in chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, uh, in Jesus Christ, we have been reconciled both to God and to each other in one body. We're a new creation, a new person. And Paul is once again instructing us on what that means uh, in our everyday life. Last week, we looked at the first 15 verses of chapter 5, and the main emphasis in those verses was to imitate Christ, uh, to walk in love as Christ loved us, verse 2 says, and as Christ gave himself up for us. And in those verses, Paul exhorts every believer just to do away with any kind of sexual sin, to do away with filthiness and every kind of impurity and greediness. Uh, He commands us to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness and sinful practices. Uh, That's in verse 11, but rather we're to expose them, to help people turn away from sinful works and turn to Christ in faith. 
And then we come here to verse 15, and he says, Therefore, look carefully at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And this idea of walking continues to come up throughout the book of Ephesians. Uh, Once again, it's a Hebraic idiom that just means uh, one's lifestyle or one's conduct. Look carefully at how you live, what you're living for, and if your life lines up with God's will or if you're walking in foolishness. This is what he's calling us to do, to take a careful, uh, introspective look into our life. And the verb there, the imperative there to look is in the present tense, meaning it's not just a one-time thing, but it's something that we should be continuously doing. I think so many Christians have the idea that the sum of Christianity takes place in about two hours on a Sunday morning service. This verse and so many other passages all throughout the Bible make it utterly clear that faith is a life. It affects our every moment. It should encompass every part of us, everything we have to do in life. It should fall under the lordship and the will of Jesus Christ. And this is why we're commanded to look at how we're living. Paul goes on and he says, Uh, Make the best use of time. Look at how you're walking. Look at how you're living. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of your time. The essence of walking in wisdom is using your time wisely. Not wasting your time. In fact, I used to work at Cashway here a few years ago. uh, From January 14th of 2014 to August 21st of 2015. And that entire time that I was working at Cashway, I was in contract compliance, and for six months I was in customer service, and I was just doing things I simply wasn't passionate about. It was just, I mean, I know it's for some people, but for me, it just wasn't my deal. And I felt like I was wasting my time, and what took me over the edge was when the CEO of the company sent out a newsletter, and he talked about different things you can get back in your life money, you can get your career back, you can get your reputation back, but there are some things in life that you will never get back, and one of them is time. You will never get your time back. And Paul says the essence of walking in wisdom is wisely using your time, making the most of the time. Now, I think what Paul intends here is an evangelistic thrust. I think he has in mind not just time in general, but taking the most of the opportunities we have to impact people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that's what he means here when he says, make the best use of your time. In fact, if you have an NIV Bible, it says, making the most of your opportunities, which I think is a better translation, getting at the meaning here. And the reason why I think that is because of what Paul's already said in verse 11, where he talks about the need to pull away from the unfruitful works of darkness and to expose people. Which, if you heard my sermon last week, the idea seems that we should be trying to get people to turn away from their sin and turn towards Christ in faith. Furthermore, Paul says something very similar to this in Colossians chapter 4. In fact, if you want to turn there, you can, or if you just want to listen along, In Colossians chapter 4, we see very uh, similar teachings as what we see in Ephesians chapter 5. There's parallel teachings. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Gentiles, eat pork chops, Starting in verse 2 of chapter 4, Paul uh, urges these Christians, he says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I might make it clear which is how I ought to speak. And then notice what Paul says next 
about praying for opportunities to declare the gospel. He says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Very similar to what Paul has already said here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Except there's more information in Colossians chapter 4. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, and then he talks about the need to let your speech be seasoned with salt. And in that same context, he's praying for opportunities to declare Christ to people. And so what I'm trying to say is that if you want to make the most of your God-given time, declare Jesus to the world. That's what it means to walk in wisdom. Be an ambassador for him. I was doing some research this week, just curious studies. I felt like I did a lot of them this week. The average person will speak about 7,000 words in any given day. It's really not that much difference between men and women. It's very similar. Yet studies indicate that only 20% of professed Christians will ever share Christ with somebody. 20% will ever share Christ with somebody. I think if Paul was here today, he would look at that statistic and he would say at least 20% of Christians are living in wisdom and making the most out of their time. Why? Because they're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in the world that is otherwise filled with fake news, as Donald Trump would say. Just throwing that out there. We have the hope of Christ. Why would we hold it back, church? Paul says here in Ephesians 5.15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time. Why? Because the days are evil. That's why it's important to make the best use of time, because the days are evil. Now, what is Paul getting at here? The idea seems to be that the general pattern of the world stands in contrast to the will of God. He said something very similar to this, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that when we were dead in our sins, we were simply just following the ways of the world, implying that the course of the world just doesn't line up with Jesus Christ and his will for our life. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just get on social media for about 10 minutes and you can just tell right away that what's acceptable in our society in terms of norms and values and the meaning of success just doesn't line up with God's idea of eternal life and success and morality. There is a contrast there. The best way I've heard it explained is an analogy that compares the world to a river current. I was thinking about this this week. It's not quite apples to apples, but I think it's enough to get the point across. Imagine if you're in a kayak and the Lord himself is standing up river from you and the world is the current of the river that's pulling you downstream and you're trying to kayak to the Lord day by day looking carefully how you walk and you just lift up your oars for a little bit. You take a little break. You take your eyes off the prize and what happens you slowly start to drift away along with the current of the world. So slow sometimes that you might not even realize it, but that current is always moving and it's never pushing you towards God. Another analogy I was thinking of, I, uh, I don't mean to brag here, but I have been blessed with a, uh, fortunately, a high metabolism. And I try to work out, I try to eat healthy, but I know at the end of the day that if I take a couple weeks off, if I slack, nothing's really going to happen. I've pretty much been this way since sophomore year of high school. I know here in a couple years when I hit the 30 mark, everything's probably going to change, right? The gray hair is going to start receding, the belly is going to whoop. For a lot of people, you know, though, you don't have, you know, this blessing, you know But the moment you stop working out, the moment you take that extra Twinkie, 
you suck that ice cream out of your straw at McDonald's, you just start losing it. If you're not constantly on guard about your health, you just slip backwards. Similarly in our faith, if we aren't constantly on guard, looking carefully at how we're living, we're going to slip backwards. Paul says, because the days are evil, he says in verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I think a better translation here would be, do not be ignorant, but think about the way, or think about the will of the Lord. It's not understand the will as in like, God has some secret plan for your life that you just don't know, like what's your future hold. That's not what this passage is getting at. He's saying, think about how the Lord wants you to live his revealed will as he's laid out in scripture, and think about how to apply that to your life. Think about what it means to live that out and live in light of the gospel. That's what it means to think about the the will of the Lord. And then he comes to verse 18 and he says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now before I try and dig into this verse, I just kind of want to think about how this verse fits into the passage. Because when I first read it, it seemed like it kind of just popped in there out of left field. Look at how you live, make the most of your time, think about the will of the Lord, and all of a sudden, don't get drunk. And it's like, how does it fit? I think the key word here is debauchery. Or as some translations say, dissipation. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Literally, wasteful living. It's the same word that's used of the prodigal son when he goes off into a distant country and it says he squandered all his property on reckless living. He wasted it. Paul's saying don't be drunk with wine. It's a waste of life. Now there's an explicit command here and that's against intoxication. And it makes sense that Paul, writing to you ancient Ephesians, uh, would warn them against drinking. I mean, if you know anything about the Greco-Roman Empire... Excessive consumption was a very severe problem. Not only that, but the Greeks believed in a mythological deity named Dionysus, who they believed to be the god of wine. And the way they had worshipped this god was literally by getting plastered. And Paul's saying, don't. Don't get plastered, don't get hammered, don't get sauced. Don't get smashed, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the explicit command is against drinking. And I know some of us are probably looking at it thinking, okay, that's not me. I don't have a drinking problem. But I do also think there's a general principle here outside the command of drinking. And that principle is don't let any external influence govern your life. For some of us, maybe it's not alcohol, maybe it's money. Maybe it's sexual pleasures. Maybe it's, I don't know, you name it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, everything is permissible for us, but dare we let anything have mastery over us. Don't be governed by external influences. The only thing we should be governed by, the only thing we should be guided by is Jesus Christ himself. You know, I was thinking about alcohol this week and intoxication, and I was just out of my own curiosity doing studies on uh, excessive drinking. I just found it interesting to think about. You know, pharmacologically, alcohol isn't a stimulant. It's a depressant. It literally depresses your central nervous system. It hinders your thinking capacity. It slows down your motor skills. It alleviates anxiety. It can cause you to lose memories. It can cause you to become numb to certain emotions. Uh, It literally changes the chemical balance in your brain. All these things that people are looking for in alcohol 
And all that does is it leaves them coming up empty. You know, a lot of people drink because they simply just want to get away from their depression. They just want to lose self-consciousness, which is the reason why so many people are okay to do karaoke and make sexual advances, because when you're intoxicated, you literally lose your inhibitions. You feel relaxed in the moment. But the reality is, is that joy or that perceived benefit that alcohol brings into your life is counterfeit and is temporary. What I mean by this is if you've ever been hammered on a Friday night, you know when you wake up on Saturday morning, you're back to reality. Except you're thirsty, you're dehydrated, and you have a lingering headache and nausea. You feel like a wreck. And here's what's interesting about alcohol. It literally uh, hinders or causes an imbalance in your serotonin or, and your um, dopamine levels in your brain. Two different chemicals that your brain needs to uh, moderate or to uh, help your mood, to help your excitement. And when these chemicals are thrown off balance, what typically happens is the person becomes depressed. And a common tendency of people who become depressed by alcohol is they cope with their depression by drinking more alcohol. And it just becomes this endless cycle, this, this general path downward that just has no light at the end of the tunnel. And in the most extreme cases, the end result is suicide from depression or organ failure. It's a counterfeit pleasure. It's temporary. It doesn't last because when you wake up the next morning, you realize you just want more and more. And you need a little bit more than you did the night before because your body has built up a tolerance to it. It just is wasteful living to the core. And the reason why it's wasteful living is because all it does is it hinders people and deceives people from turning to Christ in faith and only finding what they can find in Jesus and Jesus alone, true joy and satisfaction. It just pulls us away from Christ. Paul's saying, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, now what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? First of all, it doesn't mean that we need to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I used to have this misconception in my mind that I kind of just needed to open myself up to God and just kind of let him come upon me like a a wind or, you know, a jar of water and fill me up. That's not accurate. Romans 8, 9 makes it clear that if you're a believer in Christ, you are indwelt with the Spirit. So that's not the issue here. We read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, that we are sealed by the Spirit And there's nothing we can do to get the Spirit to depart from us. We can grieve the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. We can quench the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. But we cannot get the Spirit to depart from us. So what then, though, does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And I think part of what it means to be filled with the Spirit, or at least in helping our understanding, is to compare it to wine. What happens to drunk people? They're controlled by wine. They're governed or they're guided by wine. In contrast to that, what Paul seems to be saying is, don't be governed by wine. Let your life be governed by the Holy Spirit. But this still begs the question, what does that mean? It's something I've been wrestling with all week. What does it mean to be controlled by the Holy Spirit? And let me offer you my take on it, and you can study this out for yourself and come to your own conclusion. But here's what I believe Paul's getting at when he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, already three times in Ephesians, before this verse, we see the language of filling up. We saw it in chapter 1, verse 23, where it talks about the church being the fullness of Christ, the one who fills all in all. And then we see this language being used again, in chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, where Paul is praying for believers, and he's praying that through the Spirit, Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith, so that we would comprehend the love of Christ, 
so that we would be filled with the fullness of God. We see the language of fullness come up yet again in chapter 4, verse 13, where the goal of every Christian is stated to be to be uh, to attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. To be filled with Christ. And then we see something very similar to this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Again, a very similar passage, parallel teachings, and in that passage and in that verse... Paul admonishes the believers to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word, just being the gospel of Jesus Christ, let it dwell in you. Think about it. Here's what I think it means to be filled with the Spirit. To be utterly consumed by Jesus Christ to be captivated by Jesus Christ, to be intoxicated with his goodness to the point that it literally changes our life, it changes our interests, it changes our desires. I believe that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit, to let Christ dwell in our hearts, to think on him, to go to him in faith, and just enjoy and treasure and delight in Christ. I was thinking about a rather significant date in my life. It was sometime, I think, August 8, 2014, youth retreat at the Seussie Lake House. And it was the first time I ever got to talk to, you know, who would be my wife. She's there burning the hot dogs on the grill. And it was a really memorable moment, not so much because... I learned that she couldn't grill, but because one of the students went out on a boat, and he came back, and he lost his pants. I know. But I was talking to Maddie that first day, and man, let me tell you, I was captivated. You know that feeling of infatuation? It's just like you just can't get enough of somebody. I swore I talked to the whole rest of the night. I didn't care about the children who I was supposed to be ministering to. All I want to do is talk to Maddie. In fact, I remember going home to my house on 512 West 21st Street, and the first thing I said to my roommate, Bidhada, when I got in is, dude, I talked to an angel today. I was just so excited, and I just wanted to talk to her more. I just wanted to get to know her more. In fact, over those next couple months, there was no way I was missing a church service. (laughs) New. Off the list. And honestly, it's like just wanted to talk to her. My desires for so many other things kind of just subsided. Uh, you know, come on, you all know what love is like. <laughs> when you fall in love with somebody so hard, everything else is kind of moves out of the focus and into the peripheral. I think that is similar to what Paul is saying here about being filled with the Spirit being so captivated by Jesus Christ, being so consumed by his glory and his goodness that everything else just moves to the peripherals. And that satisfaction that we're looking for in those fake pleasures like alcohol and everything else, just it moves to the wayside because we realize we have something so much better that can offer us eternal life, life to the fullest. I believe that's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, in the following verses, we see the marks of the Spirit. We see the results of somebody who is filled by the Spirit. And the first thing we see is that people who are filled with the Spirit, they sing like it's nobody's business. They sing to themselves, they sing in their hearts, they sing to one another. They sing psalms, they sing hymns, they sing spiritual songs, a variety of worship music. A person who is filled with the Holy Spirit is characterized by worship. And that might sound goofy, but when you think about it, singing most vividly communicates an inward emotion, does it not? Like, I can give you a fuller expression of how I feel by singing to you than just telling you how I feel. Like, have you ever seen the movie Elf? It's like my favorite Christmas movie, Will Ferrell. 
I love you, I love you, I love you. He just couldn't contain it. He was in love, obviously. Makes two of us. Now, again, we're not commanded to sing, but it's the result of somebody who is filled by the Spirit. And it's like, how does this make sense? What leads a person to singing? And, you know, for me, it's hard to explain other than to think about one of my most fantastic experiences at a Husker football game. I was with my mother, and we were at a Husker football game, I don't know how many years ago, do you remember? Like, whatever, six or seven years ago, and we were playing Northwestern. And it was a really boring, dry game. And it just looked like we were going to lose. I mean, we were clear out of the end zone. We were down by I don't know how many points. It was within a touchdown, but there was just no hope. We even thought about leaving. But we stayed for the last play, and the Huskers threw up this Hail Mary, and it was caught in the end zone. Oh, man, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. This is no joke. That entire stadium absolutely erupted. It just turned into chaos. You can imagine 80 or 90,000 people on their feet, jumping around, singing, celebrating, chanting. Like, I myself lost my voice that day. Not all of it, but I sounded so raspy the next day because I myself was just outside of myself. You know, nobody told us to cheer at the end of that game. Nobody said, be loud and make noise because the Huskers just won. Rather, we just experienced something really great. And the only way that we could adequately express ourselves was through singing. We, we couldn't help but to sing and cheer. I mean, we were all just so filled with excitement that it just led to, ugh. When you're so excited about something, when you're so captivated by something, a lot of times the natural result is you just want to sing. You just want to let it out. Singing is one of the marks of being filled by the Holy Spirit. And it's something that was very common among believers in the Old Testament. When they would experience uh, the saving works of God or where they would contemplate God's goodness, they were just overjoyed and they were moved into singing. They couldn't help but to express themselves through singing. To give you one example, if you want to turn there or just listen in, listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 95. He says, Oh, come. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Why is the psalmist moved to singing? Because he was contemplating the greatness of God, and that was the only thing he could do, just burst into an emotional song of praise. And not only a song of praise, but thanksgiving. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Another mark or result of being filled by the Spirit is continual gratitude continual thanksgiving. This is what Paul says in Ephesians um, in verse 20, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now when he says for everything, I don't think he means literally everything. Like I'm not thankful for sex trafficking and child abuse. I'm not thankful for adultery and um, social injustices. I'm not thankful for Kevin Warren and the way he's handled the Big Ten Conference. I'm not thankful for the one or two times that Stacey Cannon has ever beat me in a game of pitch. But I don't think that's what the text is getting at. 
everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, everything that aligns with Jesus, that's part of his will, that's true of Jesus Christ, or that we have in and through him. The Christians should just be grounded in gratitude. And we think about all that we have in Jesus Christ. And if you truly understand grace, how could you not just be overcome by gratitude? That we were dead. We were completely dead in our trespasses. And he made us alive. We were in our sin. We were hopeless. And he gave us hope. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. And we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness and have a living hope and redemption. How could you not be moved by gratitude? And then the last uh, characteristic or uh, mark of somebody who's filled by the Spirit, or filled with the Spirit, is submission. Submitting to one another in reverence for Christ. And we're going to look more at what that word means next week. But intrinsic to the idea of submission is humility and self-sacrifice. You're literally rearranging your life under somebody else. You're looking for their needs. You're looking to help them to build people up. It's very similar to the attitude of Jesus Christ when we read in Philippians 2, it uh, says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, and have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. The mark of somebody who's filled by the Spirit is they are submissive. They're grounded in humility. They're not living for themselves. They're not living for their own self-satisfaction. They are walking in love and giving up their lives for others just as Christ gave up his life for us. Now, I don't want you to walk away from this passage and just think, okay, I need to start singing a little more, be a little more thankful, and make sure I submit myself to every kind of governing authority and to the church, blah, 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 so that I may be filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, that is not what I believe Paul is saying here. He's not saying do this so that you're filled. He's just saying, look, this is what happens when you are filled. But I think it does leave us with a rather fitting conclusion to this passage, because the beginning we started by uh, saying, take a look at our life. That was the first commandment, to look at our life. And I think one thing that might be helpful for us to consider about our own life is whether or not these marks are true of us. If we consider our own life, it's like, do we find ourselves joyfully submissive? Do we find ourselves rooted in thanksgiving? Do we find ourselves just worshipful, singing songs of praise in our heart to God, going to Him with thanksgiving? If that is true of you, it probably means you are filled with the Spirit. And if that's the case, I want to talk to you about serving on the church leadership team. I'll hit you up after the service. But if you realize that in your life, those marks just aren't true, that you're just lacking gratitude, that you're just walking around in bitterness, that you're walking around feeling empty, grumpy, just angry at life, If you find yourself living for it yourself, it's probably a telltale sign that you're not filled with the Spirit. You're not living under the control of the Holy Spirit. And if you're not filled with the Spirit, it probably means that you just aren't going to Jesus Christ in faith. You're not looking to Him. You're not moving towards Him. You're not receiving Him 
and finding your satisfaction in Jesus. And if you're not finding your satisfaction and your fulfillment in Jesus Christ, it means you're probably trying to fill the emptiness in your life with other things. Counterfeit pleasures that just don't last. And if you haven't found out yet, you'll probably find out sooner or later that those things just don't cut it. The next morning, we're just as empty as we were before, even more empty, and it's just a dead-end road. And if that is you, if you feel like that's your life and the trajectory that you're going down, man, I just humbly implore you to repent of your sin and turn to Christ in faith and receive the satisfaction that is in him, receive the fullness that is in Christ. See for yourself that what Jesus said in John 10, 10 is true, that I have come to give life and life to the fullest church. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be the people who indulge in useless, wasteful things in life, but let us just be grounded in Christ. Would you be our joy, Jesus? Help us to not turn away from you and pursue the things that just don't hold up. But let us cling to you in faith. Let us be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let us walk carefully. Please, Jesus, as you have commanded us in your word, let us make the most of our time for your honor and for your glory. And we pray this all in your name. Amen.